In my previous video, I told you about the things that evolution is not. We talked about the common misconceptions that people often have about the theory of evolution and why in some cases that may lead them to doubt the veracity of evolutionary theory. In this video, we're going to focus on what evolution actually is. We're going to talk about the key tenets of the modern theory of evolution known as neo-Darwinism and talk about much of the evidence that is present to support the theory of evolution. So stay tuned while we find out what evolution is all about. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In his amazing book, Why Evolution is True, the evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne writes the following about the theory of evolution. In essence, the modern theory of evolution is easy to grasp. It can be summarized in a single, albeit long, sentence. Life on Earth evolved gradually, beginning with one primitive species, perhaps a self-replicating molecule, that lived more than 3.5 billion years ago. It then branched out over time, throwing off many new and diverse species. And the mechanism for most, but not all, of evolutionary change is natural selection. That might be the most succinct way of encapsulating everything that we know about modern evolutionary theory, which is also known as neo-Darwinism. In the same book, Jerry Coyne goes on to talk about six key tenets of evolutionary theory. Now, there are lots of ways of breaking down the core principles of modern evolutionary theory, but I also prefer Dr. Coyne's rendition, so I'll share that with you today. The six key tenets of modern evolutionary theory are as follows. The first one is evolution. When we talk about evolution, we're talking about the fact that species change over time, and we know this is the case. And we have lots of evidence, which we'll talk about later on in this video, that allows us to observe how species have changed over time. But the second key tenet is that that change happens gradually. The second key tenet of evolutionary theory is gradualism. The change that occurs within species and as well as the appearance of new species occurs slowly over time. In some cases, this takes hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And it always takes multiple generations for this to occur. So while evolutionary change does occur, it often occurs quite slowly. And this can actually be one of the reasons. This gradualism is often one of the reasons people have a hard time grasping evolutionary theory because of how slow the changes occur. The third key tenet of modern evolutionary theory is speciation. If enough change occurs within a subpopulation of a species over time, it will become so different from the other members of its species that it can be classified as a new species. Speciation is a fact, and we know this is true for one very obvious reason. There are millions of species living on the planet today. These species didn't appear out of nothing. They all diverged from a single species that lived about 3.5 billion years ago. And as a result, we get to the fourth key tenet of modern evolutionary theory, common ancestry. Everything alive on this planet is related maybe through a long series of ancestors to everything else. We can all trace our ancestry back to that single species that lived 3.5 or so billion years ago. Some species we are clo more closely related to and some we are more distantly related to. But no matter what species it is, we can trace our ancestry back to a single common ancestor that is likely extinct to pretty much everything else on this planet. The fifth key tenet of neo-Darwinism is natural selection. And this is the thing that is also the most controversial and revolutionary about neo-Darwinism. It's the mechanism by which evolutionary change occurs. Until Darwin proposed his theory of evolution, we really didn't know how evolution occurred. We, a lot of people understood that species do change over time. But natural selection describes a materialistic process in which speciation can occur. Simply put, natural selection states that the forces acting on species over time gradually select for those variations within a species that are beneficial and removing those variations within a species that are less beneficial. This accumulation of beneficial traits allows changes to occur in species, and over time, if enough of those changes occur, we end up with speciation. The sixth key tenet of 
modern evolutionary theory or neo-darwinism is that processes other than natural selection can shape species natural selection is the major reason why species change and as far as we know it is the only way that species can become better adapted to their environment but other processes such as genetic drift do have an influence on species while it may not lead to adaptation and while it may not necessarily lead to speciation events on a regular basis that we do know that species other than natural selection do influence the evolution of species now that we've established the six core tenets of modern evolutionary theory let's talk about both how evolutionary theory can be used as a scientific theory and the evidence that supports our modern understanding of evolution. First, we have to acknowledge the fact that evolutionary theory is just that. It is a scientific theory. And we know that means that it lends itself to both the processes of inductive and deductive reasoning. In one of my earlier videos, we talked about the process of science. And in the process of science, we talked about two different types of scientific reasoning, inductive and deductive. Inductive reasoning is how we form hypotheses, how we form theories. It's the ability of scientists, or anybody actually, to take in large amounts of information and use that information and synthesize a single core concept that helps to explain those potential observations. That's what we call a hypothesis. And over time, if enough hypotheses come together or enough that hypotheses, that hypothesis is supported heavily enough, we can end up having that hypothesis elevated to a theory. We'll talk about the evidence that we have to support the theory of evolution in just a little bit. But I also want to acknowledge the fact that because evolution is a scientific theory, it does lend itself to be used in deductive reasoning as well. Deductive reasoning is how we test hypotheses. It's how we utilize scientific theories. Deductive reasoning takes a central principle, a core principle, such as species evolved through natural selection, and then utilizes that to then predict what other things should be true if that particular theory is accurate. Evolutionary theory has been used since the days of Darwin to predict where we should find specific fossils, how old specific fossils should be, or that certain species exist that we have no knowledge of actually existing or no direct evidence of their existence. Let me tell you one story about how Darwin and his contemporary Alfred Russell Wallace actually used scientific reasoning based on their ideas about evolutionary theory to predict the existence of a species. This is the story of Angrisum sesquipedale and Xanthopan morganii. Angrisum sesquipedale is a species of orchid that lives on the island of Madagascar. And in 1862, Charles Darwin received a package from one of his colleagues that contained this particular species of orchid. And what's interesting about Angrisum sesquipedale, now known as Darwin's orchid, is that it has a nectary that's over a foot long. What that means is in order for a species of animal to pollinate this orchid, it needs to stick something, probably a proboscis, almost a foot long, down into this flower in order to get the pollen and the nectar reward that that particular species would receive. Now here's where it gets interesting. On the island of Madagascar, there was no knowledge of a species of moth with a proboscis that long that it could actually be able to pollinate this particular flower. But based on what Darwin knew about orchids and his ideas about evolutionary theory, Darwin correctly predicted that there would be, at some point in time, a species of moth found on the island of Madagascar that did have a proboscis that was at least a foot in length. At the same time, his contemporary Alfred Russell Wallace was brought to, it was brought to his attention as well. Alfred Russell Wallace knew a little bit more about the flora and the fauna of this area, and he predicted that not only did this moth exist, but that he would be, ident be able to identify either the species of moth or its nearest ancestor. Based on what he knew about evolutionary theory, what he knew about the, the, the moths that actually lived on the continent of Africa, he predicted that it would be a sphinx moth because sphinx moths were the largest species of moth that lived in Africa, particularly in eastern Africa, the closest region of the continent to Madagascar. Now, what's interesting is there was not a species of sp sphinx moth known to have a proboscis that long. But Alfred Russell Wallace correctly predicted, just like Darwin also predicted, that there would be a species of sphinx moth on the island of Madagascar that had adapted itself 
to be able to pollinate this flower. Proof would not come until 1903, long after the death of Charles Darwin, that this particular species of moth did in fact exist. This was when a, a sphinx moth, now known as Xanthopan morganii predicta, aptly named because it was predicted by two different scientists, was discovered on the island of Madagascar. It was discovered while pollinating one of these, one of Darwin's orchids, Angricum sesquipedale. And lo and behold, it was discovered that this particular species of moth was, as Alfred Russell Wallace predicted, was a species of sphinx moth and did have a proboscis that was longer than one foot. In fact, what it would do is it would approach the flower, it would unroll this very long proboscis and then fly it nose first into the, into the orchid in order to be able to pollinate it. This is the power of evolutionary theory. Just like all scientific theories, it lends itself to deductive reasoning. As long as you understand how other species have co-evolved, you can begin to predict what other species might exist. We'll talk in other videos about how the predictive power of evolutionary theory has been used to discover certain species of fossil, certain types of fossils in certain rock layers where you wouldn't be able to predict them if evolutionary, evolutionary theory was not true. Now, as with all good scientific theories, the, the modern theory of evolution, also known as neo-Darwinism, has a ton of evidence to support it. In fact, there's literal mountains of evidence and over 160 years of research that have gone into building this catalog of evidence that supports modern evolutionary theory. So what I'm going to do is do a brief introduction to all these different types of evidence. And in several other videos, we'll talk in more detail about several of these different aspects of evidence that are utilized to support evolutionary theory. Perhaps the best known example of evidence that supports evolutionary theory is the fossil record. In his own time, Charles Darwin actually maligned the fossil record. But remember, he lived back in the 1800s. And at that time, there weren't whole collections of transition fossils. We hadn't yet discovered the first human ancestor fossils at that particular time. So Charles Darwin actually had a bit of a right to gripe about the fossil record because he knew that the fossil record would support his hypothesis, his theory of evolution, and that you would be able to show using the fossil record that species do change over time. But now, fast forward to 2021, and we have the fossils of hundreds of thousands of species that have existed on the planet. We have several, we have dozens of different human ancestors that have been discovered throughout the world, mainly our oldest ones living in Africa. We have a complete catalog of transition fossils showing the evolution of tetrapods from lobe-finned fish during the Devonian period, 380 million years ago. We have fossils cataloging the transition of fish into amphibians and amphibians into reptiles and then reptiles into birds and mammals in our fossil record. But some people still point out the fact that the fossil record still isn't complete. Of course it's not. One of the things we'll talk about in some of my videos is how hard it is for a fossil to actually form. It's actually a very rare event. And at this particular point in time, we have the fossil remains of somewhere between 0.1 and 1% of all species that have possibly ever lived on the planet. But let's pause for a second and think about how confusing the fossil record would be if we literally had a fossil for every single species that ever existed. Evolution tells us that species change very slowly over time. And if we had a fossil record of all of the different species and every single individual of any species that have ever lived on the planet, first off, I don't know where we would put it. That would be a lot of rocks. But secondly, let's think about what it would look like. It would look like a slow transition from one species. And at what point would you actually draw the line between when one species becomes a new species? It would be kind of looking at the full spectrum of light and deciding when yellow turns into green and when blue turns into purple. At a certain point, it's hard to draw those lines. So one of the things we can see from the fossil record that is perhaps the most important aspect of it is that first off, the fossil record is always in agreement with itself. We never find fossils out of order. In fact, we can actually use evolutionary theory to predict where we should be looking for fossils. For example, if you want to find fossils of early tetrapods, you need to look in rock that's 380 to 370 million years old. In fact, that's exactly what allowed us to discover some of the earliest tetrapod fossils. We'll talk about that in another video. But one of the things that can be pointed out is this. If even a single fossil was found out of date order, then it would destroy the entirety of evolutionary theory. 
Richard Dawkins once said this. But the problem is this. If you're trying to use this as a way of refuting evolutionary theory, you're going to be hard-pressed. Because of the millions of fossils that have been discovered in the past 160 to 200 years, not a single one of them has ever been found out of order. It's never been found where you wouldn't expect it. It agrees with itself 100% of the time and, as such, provides a rocky, solid testament to evolutionary theory. Another key concept or piece of evidence in support of evolutionary theory is biogeography. Biogeography is the study of the location and distribution patterns of species. One of the things that's amazing about the biogeography that we have to catalog evolution is how it can only and best be explained by evolutionary theory coupled with another scientific theory, plate tectonics. We now know that the reason why Earth looks the way it looks now is through the movement of those large continental plates that cause earthquakes and volcanoes, as well as the movement of land masses. And we know that the Earth didn't always look like it looks now. In fact, at one point, it was a giant supercontinent. And I say at one point, actually at several different points, the Earth's land mass was in a single giant supercontinent. And then over time, they gradually space out, reshuffle, and then they seem to come back together to form another supercontinent every few hundred million years. But what that helps to do is explain the distribution, the distribution pattern of various fossils. For example, we can explain why we can find strictly terrestrial animals both on the eastern coast of North America and the western coast of Africa. Why? Because at one point, 300 million years ago, the eastern coast of North America was attached to the western coast of Africa. But the other thing that biogeography bio does is it gives us a vast catalog of evidence for why the, the specific creation of species doesn't really make sense in terms of biogeographical contexts. So, for example, why, when we look at islands, do we see lots of flightless birds? Why, in, when we talk about oceanic islands, do we see a complete absence of mammalian species that are native to those islands? Yes, we find them now, but that's because humans have gone there and brought rats and pigs and so on and so forth. A lot of the things that we see about biogeography, the distribution patterns of fossils, the localization of certain species, the divergence of different island species, and so on and so forth, can best and really only be explained by evolution, by the migration of those species to a certain point and then their adaptation to their new environments over time. Another great piece of evidence in support of evolutionary theory is embryonic development. Embryonic development, believe it or not, has not changed all that much in vertebrates, for example. At a certain point in your development, as, a, as an embryo, you were indistinguishable from a chicken or a frog or a salamander or a fish. You were indistinguishable because one of the things that we know is that the developmental pattern of all vertebrates is very closely related. And instead, when we look at embryonic development, we don't see a whole rewriting of the embryonic programming. We see subtle tweaks. And in those subtle tweaks, we can actually often see the remnants of our ancestral past. So, for example, if you are a vertebrate, at some point during your development, you have gill slits. Now, those of us that are terrestrial vertebrates or descendant from terrestrial vertebrates, such as whales and, and dolphins, those gill slits go away. They get repurposed or they get sewn back up. But if you're a fish, the ancestor of all modern tetrapods, then it turns out that you get to keep your gill slits. Humans are another, have lots of different examples of this. For a while, you had a tail. And for most of us, that tail actually ends up dissolving. But why have it in the first place? If you're born premature, you might be born very, very hairy. You're covered in something called lanugo. Most of the rest of us, we had that lanugo when we were in the womb but we end up shedding it prior to birth. Why is it there in the first place? Well, we're now known as the naked apes, but the rest of our primate ancestors all get to keep that hair for the remainder of our life. We just happen to lose ours as part of the rewriting of our developmental programming. There are lots of examples from embryonic development of all species that help to show our interrelatedness. We can actually look back and see our ancestry as reptiles and as amphibians. During your development in the womb, you had three sets of kidneys. The first were a set of amphibian kidneys that eventually dissolved and went away, only to be replaced by a new set of kidneys, reptilian ones. Of course, those kidneys also have to go away because you're not a reptile. You're a descendant of reptiles. And finally, you get your mammalian kidneys. But why 
if we were specially created, would we have three different sets of kidneys just to have two of them go away before receiving our final ones? Why would we have a tail just for it to dissolve? To dissolve? Why would we have gill slits just for them to be sewn up? Why would we be covered in hair only for it to have it dissolve? These are just some of the examples of how embryonic development can show us our ancestral past. And again, lend credence to the fact that all species are interrelated. Another great example from anatomy that can be helpful to, to look at and support evolutionary theory are vestigial structures. Many different species have vestigial structures. If you remember from my previous video, a vestigial structure is a structure in an organism that is either no longer useful or, at the very least, exacted or used for a new purpose. We talked about ostriches and emus and rheas, these large birds that have never been able to fly yet still possess wings. Why does a whale or a snake have a pelvis if they don't have legs to attach them to? Why do you have an appendix when you don't need one? And in fact, in a significant portion of the human population, why do these particular, does this organ fail and, and lead to a potentially fatal infection? Why, when you get scared, or when you get excited, do you get little bumps on your arms and legs? Those muscles that can that raise your hair up are called the erector pili, and they're designed to fluff your hair or your, if you're a bird, feathers out, just like when you scare a cat or a dog wants to let you know that it's angry with you. You don't have the fur anymore, yet you still have the muscles. These are all examples of vestigial structures, things that are no longer useful or don't serve the original purpose for which they evolved. So why are they there in the first place? It's simple. Vestigial structures are remnants. They are remnants of our ancestral past that are there just as a way of sort of cluing us into the, what we used to be, who our species used to be, and from whom we are descended. The opposite of a vestigial structure, kind of, is an atavism. An atavism is the reemergence of an ancestral trait. Occasionally, human beings are born with a, pre with a tail. The tail is typically removed very shortly after birth, but all that is is a remnant of the molecular program that under, used to underlie our development. Occasionally, birds can be born with teeth. They still have the genes to make teeth. They still have the molecular programming to make teeth, but it's been turned off. It was turned off tens of millions of years ago during the evolution of birds from reptiles. Birds, as we'll learn later on, are built to be ultra light. In order to give them the ability to fly, they had to make some sacrifices. They have pneumatic bones with holes in them to make them super strong and light. And they've lost their teeth as a way of lightening their load. But under the right conditions, you can actually trick birds or through, the, for, through random mutation, some birds can actually produce teeth that actually show that that programming still exists. Why would they have that programming? Occasionally, whales or dolphins or even snakes are actually born with hind limbs. We know those species don't have legs, but they still have the programming underlying them that if under the right conditions, it can be activated, typically through a spontaneous mutation to produce those limbs. Why do they have that machinery? It's simple. Because dolphins and snakes and whales, they're all descended from tetrapod ancestors. Ancestors that had the ability to produce four limbs. But over time, they evolved to lose the function of those limbs because their lifestyles changed. They evolved. They adapted to their new environment. Another thing that adds, adds evidence to our understanding of evolutionary theory is our new modern understanding of molecular biology. Our understanding of the molecular makeup uh, in our genetics helps us to understand our interrelatedness. Perhaps one of the best pieces, pieces of evidence to support the united nature of all living things is the universal genetic code. Organisms from the simplest bacterium, the weirdest archaea, to the most complex multicellular organism all share the same genetic code. We use the same codons to make the same amino acids and use those amino acids in the same way to build proteins. The odds of every single species coming up with that same genetic code all on their own, I had once heard described as one over the number of atoms in the known universe. That's how small the chances are, essentially zero, that this would randomly happen that every single species that we know of on the planet uses the same genetic code. No, instead, the most logical explanation is that this, uh, that this 
that this particular genetic code originated in the first common, the last common ancestor of all living things. And we've used it ever since because it's simply too important, too central to life to be modified and allowed to vary over evolutionary time. Another great piece of evidence for molecular biology are pseudogenes. I talked about these in my other video about what evolution isn't. Pseudogenes are broken genes. The example I use in humans is the GULO gene that's broken in all primates that prevents us from making our own vitamin C. But pseudogenes provide a clue to our ancestral past. Why is it broken in all primates and broken in us? Well, because we're primates. In fact, we share a number of, of, of identical mutations in our Psi GULO pseudogene with other primates. And there are other ones that are just ours. They help to show where we've diverged. And in some cases, we'll talk about things called molecular clocks that help us predict how long ago it has been since we've diverged. The other thing that all living things share from a molecular biological context is we all use the same me method for storing genetic information and processing it into proteins. The central dogma describes that how living things all store their genetic information in the form of double-stranded DNA. It is then converted into an mRNA message and then converted into a protein by ribosomes using that identical genetic code. All of these pieces of evidence, plus much more in the realm of molecular biology, all points to the fact that all of life is united and descended from a single common ancestor and thus proves our interrelatedness. Another great example of evolution is something called convergence or convergent evolution. Yes, convergence is the opposite of divergence. Over time, species diverge. They get evolutionarily more distant from each other due to different selection pressures. But what happens when similar selection pressures act on very distantly related species? Well, it turns out that life tends to react in similar ways. Let's look to the ocean for an example. Whether you're a dolphin or a whale or a shark or a fish, if you live in the water or go to birds, penguins, if you live in the water or your primary habitat is the water, your body plan tends over time to get more hydrodynamic. Why? Because the, the more hydrodynamic you are, the faster you're able to move, the better you're able to hunt or evade prey and the less energy you use doing so. Now, I don't think anybody would suggest that dolphins and penguins and sharks are each other's closest ancestors. They're not. They're actually quite distantly related to each other. But they've all converged on a similar body plan because, uh, as a result of similar selection pressures. This shows the power, of, the power of selection pressure and the power of evolution to shape animals and other species to fit their environments. Another great example of convergent evolution comes from plants that live in the desert. I can show you two identical plants. Here are two pictures. Now, I know you're tempted because I'm going to guess the majority of you watching this are in North America to say those are both cacti. You're half right. One of them is a cactus. The other one is known as a euphorb. But note that they both have a thick trunk, round shape, they lack leaves and instead have spines. And if you could see it, you would see that they have a thick cuticle to trap in water and a shallow, wide root network. As you would probably guess, both of these species of plants can be found in desert environments. The difference is cacti are found in the New World. Euphorbia are found in the Old World. And what's really interesting about that is they are quite distantly related to each other. They are not each other's nearest relatives, not on a genetic level or a physiologic level. But they've converged on a very similar body plan because they are subjected to the same selection pressures. The question would be, why would there be, if there was special creation, why would we have cacti in the new world and euphorbia in the old world? The answer is you wouldn't because cacti do just as good in an African desert as they do in, in a North American desert. And euphorbs do just as well in a North American desert as they do in an African desert. There's no benefit to one or the other. They've just adapted to similar body plans through different approaches. Another great example, a great piece of evidence that I like to talk about, perhaps my favorite, so I saved it for last, is anatomy. In particular, bad design. 
if you don't believe in evolution, you must believe in some type of creationist process. But here's the problem. If we're going to talk about bad design, what we're talking about is mistakes that would have been made by an intelligent designer. If you look around, there are tremendous amounts of examples of bad design. And the reason I talk about bad design is this, because evolution is not about perfection. Evolution is about good enough. It's about something that improves the lifestyle. And because evolution can't work from scratch, it must work with what exists. We often end up with the appearance of bad design. So let's first talk about bad design in humans. We've already talked about the appendix, right? That's a great example of not good design. In fact, in a certain number of humans, uh, a large proportion of humans that will actually become infected at some point and need to be removed. If modern medicine wasn't a thing, you would probably just die if your appendix burst. We also have talked about the fallopian uh, ovarian gap. So there's a gap between the ovary and the fallopian tube, and the egg actually has to traffic a small space to get into the fallopian tube, and sometimes it misses. In these cases, fertilization can occur in the abdomen and cause the death of both the fetus and the parent uh, and the mother if it's not treated properly. But one of the things you'll notice when you start to get to be my age or uh, of a certain age is that your back and your knees, they start to hurt. And one of the reasons why your back and your knees start to hurt is we've spent the last uh, 300 or 400 years, 400,000 years walking upright. And it turns out that even though our bodies have gone through lots of different contortions that get us to walk upright, it's had to do so with sacrifices. And we're not quite perfect at walking bipedally. We have some great adaptations that make it possible and we're better at it than most other species. But some of those adaptations come at a cost. For example, your back and your knees start to hurt as you get older. Why? Because you're bearing your full body weight on two limbs as opposed to four. Your back starts to hurt because your spine has an S-shaped curvature that allows you to get your rear end under you so that you can be more vertical in your posture. But walking upright has also come with some other consequences. For example, we have had to narrow our pelvic girdle. And that goes for both men and women. This is particularly problematic during childbirth. And one of the, one of the odd things about humans is that birth has always been a risky proposition. The main reason why is as our pelvis, as our pelvis got more narrow, our craniums, our skulls actually got larger to house a larger brain, which meant that when human mothers needed to give birth, they were often giving birth to something that was too big to make it through the birth canal. And as a result, giving birth up until the 19th century or even the 20th century with the invention of modern medicine was a very scary proposition. Because even if a few things went wrong, it was possible for the mother and the child to die during childbirth. The, invitation, the invention of the modern cesarean section has helped solve a lot of these problems. But as a result, not only was, was pregnancy and birth a risky pro, a delivery a risky proposition, it also locked human birth weight in a very tight bell-shaped curve. Because if babies were born too small, they were likely immature and would die. If the babies were born too big, they would die during childbirth because they weren't able to get out of the mother. This is kind of a, a weird thing to notice, but it's absolutely true. And we can actually follow and, and show a bell-shaped curve for the average birth weight of a human baby being right around seven pounds for the majority of humankind. The other interesting uh, consequence of this narrowing of the birth canal is almost all humans are born premature. I know you think nine months, that's full gestation. It is now. But for our species, we really ought to gestate for several more months. And in fact, if you think about what a newborn human baby can come out doing compared to what most other newborns, dogs, cats, even chimpanzees, we can't do much as newborns. Most other species can. This is because we're actually born premature in order for us to be able to escape because of our large heads and narrow pelvises. Let's look at exam some other examples of bad design. We talked in the previous video about the panda. Why doesn't the panda have an opposable thumb? Because it's always gripping those branches. It doesn't because it's a bear. Now, some other people might point to the fact that they have something called a pseudo thumb. They do. It's actually a bone in their hand that's enlarged over time to sort of act as a thumb. But that being said, it still has five fingers. Why wouldn't one of its fingers just become a thumb if you were creating a panda from scratch? You would do that, but not, but, but not if... Uh, but because evolution can't create structures de novo or from scratch, it's stuck with this sort of elongated palm 
Why do moths always get trapped in lights? Well, that has to do with how moths navigate the universe. Moths are nighttime animals, and they actually navigate with the moon. Now, the moon is so far away and so large that at the rate at which a moth moves, it can use the moon as a guide. It doesn't move relative to the moth as far as the moth is concerned. So if it wants to go straight, it just keeps the moon, for example, on its right. And as long as the moon is on its right, it knows it's going in a straight path. If all of a sudden the moon is straight forward or to its left, it knows it's made a turn. What happens when a moth approaches a light bulb? Moths don't approach a light bulb to be warm. They don't care. They're cold blooded. They're not like you and me where we huddle up to heat when we're cold. What happens is they get too close to the light bulb, which their tiny brains think is the moon. And they try to keep the moon on the left. And if the moon is always on the left, when you're that close to a light bulb, you're just making a circle around a light bulb until eventually you touch the light bulb and you burn yourself to death. That's a terrific example of poor design. That is not how one would design a moth if it, so that it doesn't get... Otherwise, if you were designing moths at the same time as humans, you wouldn't make it so they would instantly fly into a flame or a fire or a light bulb. It doesn't make any sense. Another great example of poor design, let's look at sea turtles. Sea turtles are amazing, majestic creatures. They can live to be over 100 years old under some circumstances. This is why I won't ever let my kid get a turtle as a pet. You really shouldn't own a pet that you might have to bequeath to your grandkids in 80 years. I think that's just nuts. But I digress. Let's get back to where we were. Sea turtles. They live their entire lives deep within the ocean, coming up once in a while to breathe air. But when a sea turtle wants to give birth, what does it have to do? It has to drag itself up onto a beach arduously exhaust itself digging a pit and laying its eggs inside of the pit and then drag itself back into the ocean. But then what happens is when those little baby turtles hatch, the majority of them are actually picked off by shorebirds before they can even make it back into the water. Reproductive success would be greatly enhanced among sea turtles if a sea turtle could just give birth in the water. Why can't it? It's simple. Turtles are reptiles. Reptiles evolved hundreds of millions of years ago from amphibian ancestors to give birth to terrestrial eggs. And reptiles can't rewrite their ancestral history. So sea turtles must come on land just for the sheer act of laying their eggs and then crawling back into the ocean and hoping at least some of their offspring can make it back onto the shore. Let's look at one more hilarious example of poor design. Let's look at the kiwi. Nope, that's a kiwi fruit the kiwi, which is a bird that lives in New Zealand. What is this bird missing? Altogether, this bird is missing two whole appendages. Now we've looked at ostriches and rheas and emus and we see that they have wings and we go, well, those are vestigial structures because, you know, they don't fly. Kiwis don't even have wings. Actually, they do. They have the world's tiniest little wing. Here's a picture of it. And as you can see, um, if you were ordering chicken wings and you got those, you would be very, very upset. But you see, kiwi lived on New Zealand. And for the longest time throughout their evolution, there were no terrestrial predators that would harm a bird. Therefore, there was no reason for the kiwi to fly. It had no place to go anyways. It was on an island in the middle of the ocean. So gradually, over time, its wings went away. It now has no upper appendages. Now, if you were making this bird... The way I would design it would be to give it at least some type of upper appendage, maybe some little T-Rex arms or something like that, but instead it has nothing. And as a result, as humans gradually populated New Zealand, they brought with them their domestic cats and their domestic dogs, rats and mice, and now the Kiwi are forced to run for their lives, unable to fly away as their ancestors would have hundreds of thousands of years ago. So like I talked about in my previous video, evolution does not yield perfect design, it yields good enough. And sometimes, when situations change, what used to be good enough is not so good anymore. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we talked about what evolution is and some of the evidence that supports evolutionary theory. If you haven't watched my previous video on what evolution isn't, I encourage you to go back and watch it. Collectively, these two videos I think will give you a very good idea of how evolutionary theory works and the evidence that supports it. Also, I'll help you deconvolute some of the misconceptions that people have about evolution. I hope you've learned a lot and I hope you'll turn tune into some of my other videos. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye.